Welcome to FutureX, the podcast where we look to solve the variable that is the future of Web3. Every week, we'll talk with some of the brightest minds in the blockchain and Web3 space, from top investors to founders and builders, paving the way for a decentralized world. So what is the future of blockchain? What will Web3 look like in 2050? Let's explore together. Welcome to FutureX, Sync Futures podcast series highlighting some of the brightest minds in Web3. I'm Rachel uh, from Sync Futures, your host today. So together with me today, Irene, Head of Strategy at Layer Zero Labs. Irene, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Rachel. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Thank you. Um, Irene, first of all, uh, would you love to have a bit intro of yourself and Layer Zero? Absolutely. As you said, I am head of strategy at Layer Zero Labs. Layer Zero Labs is the creator of Layer Zero, the protocol, which is the leading omnichain interoperability protocol, which uh, right now is uh, an infrastructure tool that is used by projects across DeFi, NFT collections, gaming, TradFi, and enterprise as well to enable communication between smart contracts on different chains. We are entirely focused on building the cross-chain and omni-chain future. For myself, I joined Layer Zero Labs a little more than a year ago. I started as an integrations engineer, then was leading our biz dev and integrations team, and now I'm focused on company-wide strategy. I started my, my career actually studying computer science and training as an athlete, through a series of different experiments, startups, and roles, I ended up here. I'm happy to dive in more if that's of interest, but overall, that's my uh, background. Oh, that's impressive. Uh, How do you first get into Web3? And uh, how do you first uh, discover Bitcoin yourself? Yeah, it's a fascinating story. I had dropped out of university very early in my undergrad years. I had been studying computer science at Harvard, and ended up moving to New York after dropping out and joining the founding team of a menswear startup called Growing Blazers. I'm still super proud of what I worked on at the time there, and and the company is growing, doing quite well now. It just so happened that two of the earliest investors in Growing Blazers were Tyler and Cameron Winklevoss, the founders of Gemini, and also two of the earliest proponents of Bitcoin. And so that was uh, intellectually my first touch point with Bitcoin. As a self-taught engineer, I read the white paper and was fascinated, but didn't do very much beyond just buying Bitcoin and holding at the time. Later on, I would say summer of 2020, I re-engaged, had been hearing a lot about Solana from friends that uh, were engineers and starting to hack on things on the side. I started reading a bunch of white papers, as people do, and became interested from the investment standpoint. So uh, from that lens, there were a lot of interesting DeFi protocols launching and also uh, a huge sort of coalescence around NFTs and what crypto could do for artwork. Uh, Later on, I discovered Layer Zero and particularly the space of cross-chain interoperability and uh, was very fortunate to align with the team and join. You're now the head of strategy, uh, but uh, could you let us know that what is a typical day looks like as a head of strategy? What are the areas of focus and your the projects that you're leading? Yeah, the fun part about my job is that every day looks really different. Uh, when I'm in our office in Vancouver, It is a very collegial environment. I come in at 9 a.m. and we have a series of, or I have a series of meetings with function leaders all across the org. So I work really closely with our VP of engineering, Caleb, also one of our co-founders on all of the backend projects. And then we coordinate with the front end team. Uh, The the lead there, his name is Gonzalo, he's brilliant, uh, currently based out of Berlin. then there's also coordination with our BD team and our DevRel team, uh, and then also external projects that are building with us. If it was uh, a few months back, I would say I was meeting with 10 projects a day and talking with their CTOs about 
how they were going to integrate layer zero and what the ideal user experience was in architecture and, and helped guide them with that integration. These days, I travel quite a bit. So I'm calling from London. I'm actually sitting in the office of one of our investors, Enamoka. They're super kind to let me be here. And when I travel, I get to spend time in person with each of these teams and uh, align around how we can be most supportive on the layer zero side, but also integrate them into upcoming product launches. So you've held like various role uh, in layer zero uh, strategy, like you used to be an engineer, and I understand that like from business development side, you must be contributing a lot as well. I mean, which role do you love most? I'm very happy doing uh, what I do now. And I think I so love working with people and developers in our space. By sitting this role of strategy, I get to do that uh, around the world as well. And so next month I'll be in Paris and at ETCC, Stable Summit, DeFi Security Summit, SheFi, uh, I'll get to all kinds of people who are building across all of the different verticals and use cases I mentioned before. I also think uh, in this role, I get to work really closely with our co-founders and they are, of course, the inventors of the protocol and have a really grand vision for where the space is headed and uh, getting to be a part of those decisions is incredibly fun and generative and exciting. Yeah, we also interviewed uh, Brian last year, co-founders of Layer Zero, who gave us an overview uh, of their projects uh, and your vision. And I mean, like what, uh, like since then, I think like for the last year, uh, things change a lot and there's lots of uh, development uh, your side as well. If you love to name just one uh, most exciting achievements of Layer Zero, uh, which one would you prefer? Yeah. I think what is most exciting and has surprised us was really the volume of messages across the protocol. We anticipated that it would take way more than a year to hit 1 million messages. We ended up exceeding that uh, milestone uh, and, and hit not only 1 million in less than a year, but we're now past 30 million and trending 10 million each month. So I, uh, seeing that exponential growth and also the diversification across the different projects that are driving that has been uh, really motivating for us. Also the adoption of our Omnichain standards, OFT, which stands for Omnichain Fungible Token and ONFT has been astounding. Uh, many projects are doing it organically. You can go to our docs and just start building. And if you look at the cohort of top five projects across different ecosystems, at least a handful of them have already integrated their protocol token into OFD. Yeah, congratulations. Uh, uh, but what is, uh, would you love to let us know like, what is the biggest driver for your uh, adoptions? And uh, uh, I mean, for all the products and which ones uh, do you think that uh, users love most? Right now, OFT really is the product that has hit product market fit. I think having a few live at the very beginning, which were sort of core building blocks of DeFi and in particular ecosystems, one that comes to mind is BTCB, which is a version of Rat Bitcoin uh, issued by Ava Labs and was converted to an OFT several months ago, allowed users to actually experience the huge step forward in uh, omni-chain experiences versus the previously fragmented single chain tokens that would then be bridged via wrapped asset bridges or um, locked smart contract bridges. And so as a user, once you experience that, you then want to use the same standard for whatever you build. And I think that aha moment was what uh, led to this inflection point. And, and now we're far beyond just BTCB. If you use the Joe token or the cake token uh, or some stable points that are now coming out, which are OFTs, that magic of only needing one gas token and only paying for gas for that transfer, immediately having the token show up in your wallet on the other side and not fearing uh, for the security or perpetual risk of having the real value be locked in a smart contract owned and operated by a service provider or a different team is hugely accretive for the entire ecosystem.
Yeah, I agree. I think like uh, everyone's been talking about uh, security for bridges because I mean, for the last one or two years, we saw most of the attack actually came from uh, bridges, and uh, yeah. people start to ask like, which bridges uh, like uh, is safe. I mean, how do you respond to that? Uh, and uh, I mean, from your perspective, uh, uh, what is the most vulnerable point, and how would you? solve this problem, Dean? It's a really good question. And I have spent a lot of time with our CTO in particular, analyzing the major bridge hacks of the last year. In fact, last fall, we gave a talk to Stanford Crypto about bridge hacks and did a line by line analysis of a few uh, really major ones. I think what people often overlook is that the primary reason for these bridge hacks was not due to architectural flaws. So that's really important as well when you're selecting a bridge or designing one, it was actually due to smart contract bugs. And this is the fear uh, of, of every developer in our space. When you go to bed at night, you're worrying about uh, the security or potential vulnerabilities in your smart contracts. With many of these a benign upgrade or a seemingly benign upgrade made by a developer that likely was trying to just improve the protocol, led to a vulnerability. And because many of these bridges are built with upgradable smart contracts that allow for them to push these upgrades and or push contagion to all of the applications built on top of it, um, it means that when an issue like this happens, very quickly, it can lead to a catastrophic effect for an entire ecosystem. And so we saw this last summer with the, the Nomad hack, unfortunately. When you were thinking about bridges, there are three principles that come to mind and really inform our design for layer zero, which is a messaging protocol that can be used to build bridges. And those three principles are uh, immutability, permissionlessness, and censorship resistance. Immutability, I refer to around smart contracts and whether they are upgradable or non-upgradable. Immutability is also necessary to guarantee those two subsequent properties. For permissionlessness, in regards to layer zero, the protocol, it will always be open and enable developers to build with the protocol. Uh, for example, the off-chain infrastructure involved in the protocol can be swapped in and out at any point in time at the discretion of the application builder. In this way, layer zero is a true uh, evergreen primitive. Layer zero labs as a dev company could disappear tomorrow and all of the projects that currently have integrated OFT, ONFT, uh, layer zero for our contract invocation within their protocol could continue to do so forever and you know swap out the layer zero labs relayer for one that's run by gelato or one that's run by themselves uh, that's very aligned with the ethos of teams like uniswap and also the uh, ethereum foundation censorship resistance then comes in to uh, guarantee that uh, one our team can never uh, censor messages that are going across the protocol or reorder them. This protects uh, protocols from uh, arbitrage opportunities or uh, further MEV strategies from you know, high frequency trading firms, for example, that are harmful to an entire ecosystem. And also if you use cross-chain messaging in uh, situations like cross-chain governance, or even if nation states were to utilize the blockchain for uh, voting, it's incredibly important that the integrity of these messages is preserved. And so these principles ultimately, we believe, define what a secure and high integrity messaging protocol uh, looks like and therefore is, is the basis for a secure bridge. Yeah, in terms of the last point that you mentioned, the censorship uh, resistance, I mean, although like, as a user, we definitely love it, but we understand that there's like increasing uh, regulatory concerns uh, over the decentralized world, and uh, uh, we all see that. I mean, like uh, each of the, the I mean, most of the uh, advanced uh, financial centers being taking actions and uh, releasing new uh, regulations uh, on cryptos. And how do you balance the two? And um, and how do you see the chance? Yeah, you raise a very uh relevant and live concern for a lot of uh, builders and uh, regulators in the space. Our belief in, in something that history can vouch for is if you build technology, 
that enables censorship or can be uh, modified or perverted to comply with new regulation, it will be used in that way. So by creating layer zero to be truly non-order enforced, uh, meaning that messages always have to be sent in the order in which they are submitted, it means that even if a regulatory body said, we want to censor this particular message, the protocol simply cannot do so. It would mean that the whole pathway would be blocked and uh, no messages would be sent through on, on that pathway. And so by creating it this way, we are guaranteeing that layer zero can't be modified to comply with particular uh, regulatory desires. Again, it's, it's a tool that is open source and is evergreen and therefore is built in the best interests of developers. That being said, we care a lot about regulation right now. Uh, in many instances, regulation is a positive thing and is good for consumer safety. So, you know, we're looking forward to being a part of these conversations and advocating for greater literacy around blockchain technology, particularly in the United States. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, then as I understand your position, I mean, yourself as more as the infrastructures and for each of the apps that and protocols that build on top of that, uh, would I mean like compile with their like, uh, uh, I mean like regional regulations or I mean like which destination and which uh, uh, countries or regions that they would love to uh, open their, I think like service to, right? Yeah. It's ultimately up to builders uh, how they want to create their product, but our guarantee to the ecosystem and everyone who uses our protocol is that we've created a tool which is always open, always permissionless, and uh, is, is open source. And therefore, our infrastructure layer will not be the reason for a downtime or failure or uh, you know, regulatory crackdown or compliance there. Uh, so, you know, we're excited to see what builders create and also how different nations evolve and are particularly uh, keen to see some of the, the countries in, in East Asia and all Europe uh, evolve to support the uh, advancements in, in our industry. Sure. Yeah, that's cool. And um, also, I understand at Layer Zero, we all know that's like a, a cross-chain bridge. So you must believe in a multi-chain world, right? Uh, although there are um, some uh, discussion out there saying, say, uh, the world of public chain has ended. I would love to really hear from you, your perspective. Do you think that uh, there could be a dominant, dominant public chain out there with uh, multiple chain? Or do you think that, I mean, like multiple sort of like at bro up uh, ideas uh, would be the future. So what, how do you see their, their future of the multi-chain world? Yeah. I think anyone who still believes the thesis that uh, Ethereum has won and all builders will return to just building within uh, the tightly defined Ethereum ecosystem is not popping their head up and looking around. Uh, L2 scaling solutions, one should strongly be considered part of the Ethereum ecosystem, and there are many that are thriving right now. Uh, and in addition to that, teams like OP Labs have now you know, opened up the OP stack, and we have the super chain, and uh, many, many strong teams launching their own, like the base team, the Zora chain. And uh, Arbitrum, for example, has Arbitrum Nova and now Orbit, so teams can launch their own Arbitrum chains. We're seeing this across every single uh, layer two team and their offerings. But then also there are huge venture funding rounds backing alt l ones and different non-EVMs. We had Aptos and, and Sui launch this year. Um, we also have some Cosmos chains coming out. Uh, and I am really excited for what each of their different ecosystems can enable, which existing chains cannot. I as a builder have always considered different chains to be like different programming languages. I've said this before, as a web two developer, you wouldn't think to yourself, what can I build with C++? You would have a problem that you wanna solve, create a solution for it, develop a, a user facing product for it, 
And as you're doing so, look at the tools at your disposal to build that to your best ability. And so those are all these different programming languages, security operations tools, automation tools, front end languages, uh, and, and together you, you build a fantastic project. Using layer zero under the hood, you can leverage uh, a ZK rollup for uh, settlement. You can leverage Ethereum for liquidity. You can allow users to mint their NFTs on Polygon. Uh, you can build a uh, gameplay on an app subnet. All of this is possible. And then on the front end, you can abstract the complexity away and just offer a game, not a blockchain-based game, just a game that uses blockchain to offer something that is truly different than what uh, building a, a Web2 or standard PC console-based um, game could offer. Or, you know, it's the same with new financial products. Under the hood, in one transaction, you might be lending on Ethereum, but borrowing on Polygon ZK EVM and uh, borrowing on uh, Optimism, like I can name so many different chains, rather than needing six different gas tokens, you pay with one, which is something called gas abstraction, and it's native to integrating layer zero, and you collapse that into one click in one transaction. Again, you've now offered a a truly simplified user experience and has opened up the, the usability of your product to hundreds of millions rather than the concentrated 10,000 DeFi DGENs that use you know, 10 of the top protocols every single day. And this is the blocker we all face. We can't continue to build projects that are sustainable, generate revenue and offer, uh, offer meaningful yield if we're just selling to the same 10,000 users. Yeah, I would love that. Uh, right now, I think like uh, managing like liquidity across different chains is um, very painful, even personally. Uh, and um, as builder, we also find it very difficult uh, to cater to different uh, chains users' needs, right? And in order to achieve what you just said, uh, I mean, like uh, there's still understand there's a long way to go, right? Not only uh, should the assets be bridges, uh, but uh, uh, also we would uh, look for solutions to enable the money Legos across different chains and others. Um, and uh, what do you think that uh, would be the most important part or the immediate uh, uh, like tax uh, that Layer Zero would do all I mean like or in other words, uh, what is your roadmap uh, for the next year and uh, what are the problems that you will have to solve uh, within the foreseeable futures? Yeah. For sure. Uh, there is a lot in our roadmap for the next six months. And so our engineers are heads down, hard at work. I'll be back in our office for all of August to participate in person in this sprint. Unfortunately, there are a lot of things I can't share uh, publicly, but what I can say is we are continuing to launch on more chains. And these are chains that are in high demand from developers who want to integrate layer zero. Uh, some are EVM, some are non-EVM. Uh, and we are also going to be launching more products and tools that make it easier for developers to build cross-chain. Um, we have worked with uh, incredibly talented dev teams who go into our docs and our GitHub repos and just figure it out and, and build. We we review their code. It looks fantastic. It goes out. But like I said, if part of our ambition is to open up the usability and the accessibility to building and using blockchain products, we have to make it easier for, let's say, a new Solidity dev to integrate layer zero. So you can expect products that optimize uh, the ability to further decentralize your validation layer the layer zero network to teams that might be uh, like brand new solidity devs or college dropouts. Uh, we want every kind of builder to be able to utilize layer zero. And uh, we also are going deeper into different verticals. DeFi is going to be our bread and butter. Uh, however, there's so much inbound interest from gaming studios and consumer fake facing product teams. And so there are more opportunities in that space as well to provide solutions that are better than the incumbents and still fall within the space of, of cross-chain infrastructure. So that's the tease that I can offer. And uh, following our official Twitter handle is the best way to see what is coming and when and how you can be a part of it.
look forward to it. Um, also, I mean, I would love to learn you as a person as well. I mean, you are a developer by trade, and uh, we know that that in the block, especially in the blockchain space, uh, there were lots of male developer instead. So, what what drove you into uh, design and engineering uh, at the first place? And did you find anything like uh, any difficulty or advantage as a female engineers? Yeah. That's a great question. I, my initial touch point with computer science was when I was in high school. I actually was a gamer myself, but I played games like Neopets. And uh, these games offer users the opportunity to customize their experience so long as they are familiar with some front end programming languages. And so I remember myself them so I could have like sparkles on my Neopets profile or homepage. I was very young at the time. Uh, and then later on, I in high school was doing research on uh, this, actually the school to prison pipeline in the United States, particularly in uh, Michigan, in the city of Detroit. This is an issue that's very specific to the American schooling system and incarceration system. Through that experience, I realized that uh, this corner of academia was very siloed from big tech or just like tech at large in the United States. And these academic departments often didn't have the resources or uh, native, I guess, within that department skill set to develop advanced data visualizations or models. They usually had to collaborate with uh, a computer science uh, postdoc or, or grad student. Um, on this particular project, we didn't have that resource, so I started to teach myself, and that opened up a whole other lane of interest in the uh, nexus of machine learning and racial justice in the United States, uh, particularly around police technology and some of the uh, advancements there, but also really concerning applications of technology in uh, settings that are highly or cities that are highly policed in the United States. So that's why I went to Harvard to study computer science and uh, uh, African American studies. One important uh, philosophical area of interest of mine was anti-surveillance or surveillance theory. And this actually maps on perfectly to censorship resistance. So here you can sort of see full circle how now my work at Layer Zero actually does enable the kind of human rights and civil rights future I am really passionate about. Wow, so you were in the gaming industry even earlier. Um, how, how have things changed? I mean, throughout the years, uh, do you think that, I mean, like, uh, women's position in all those that traditional uh, boy clubs are uh, being improving or I mean like are you seeing actually with the economic slowdown things are worsening right now? That's a great question. I, a few really optimistic things I'll, I'll say and then also my observations about crypto in particular. What's making me optimistic is that when I was at university before I dropped out and also when I returned for a period of time the brightest computer science students I knew were women. The top performing computer science students I knew were women, uh, top marks on all exams, the ones who secured the best engineering internships. Uh, not to say I didn't have fantastic experiences yeah. with my male classmates, and many of them are now building incredible things, our founders, you know, same with the women. However, I, like I said, best engineer I know are women. I, that makes me really bullish. On the crypto side, it's true. You interact with a lot of uh, teams and CTOs and they're oftentimes male. I think that how we help with this transition and, and grow the community of female devs in crypto are to onboard more Web2 devs into the space uh, and also to build stronger communities uh, for women in crypto. And so. I recently have gotten more involved in a group called SheFi, which my dear friend Maggie Love has spearheaded. She's doing an incredible job. And this summer in July, there will be the very first SheFi Summit I am speaking at in Paris. And these opportunities are meaningful, not because you, know, you can network with other women, but because you form friendships. 
and uh, you know, friendships were also what, in my CS experience, helped me learn. You're working on a problem set, you're trying to debug your code, and it's the people around you who help you become a better developer and ask you questions and uh, sort of jam out loud with you. And so I think uh, creating more venues for that kind of uh, friendship building is, is incredibly important. I also think that my experience at Layer Zero has given me confidence in what uh, crypto and blockchain teams will look like in the future. Layer Zero is the first team I've been a part of in which I felt like I didn't have to have a strategy as a woman to succeed. I come in, I uh, am very vocal, very authentic, uh, very casual as well. You're catching me coming from the gym. I'm wearing my gym clothes and showered. Uh, and I have a seat at the table, as they say. I, I know that my colleagues on the leadership team take my opinions very seriously, uh, including on the product and, and technical side. So Layer Zero certainly is a company that wants to hire more women and excellent talent. And there are other teams that are doing so as well. Cool. Then what advice would you give to the woman who might be interested in, I mean, the Web3 space, either for like recreations or for a career? The advice I'd give is the advice I'd give anyone who wants to come into the space. Uh, begin reading and consuming knowledge from multiple inputs. So yes, read the white papers, but also listen to podcasts and go to meetups and events. Uh, if you can consume this knowledge in different forms of media, you will sort of catch up and get to that inflection point yourself where it starts to become a fluency, just like learning a different language much quicker. Uh, I also think when you're deciding on the team that you want to join or if you're going to build a project yourself, you should diligence each of the spaces the way an investor would. Um, so start speaking with people, asking questions, uh, using tools like Crunchbase, for example, to look into if they've secured funding, are they bootstrapping? If they're bootstrapping, what is their model for incentivizing their community? Do you believe it's sustainable? And then actually meet the teams, speak with them in person or get on the phone with them and ask yourself if these are people you admire and want to become more loved. Because Chandra, if you work in crypto, it will be an 80 hour a week job at minimum. Uh, Layer Zero has very much become my life. And so, I am learning and uh, like adopting the the habits and uh, best insights of my peer set from hours and hours spent with them in the office and over Zoom. Um, and then, you know, specific to women, I would say is reach out to other women and ask about their experiences back channel. Also, when you are uh, looking into different projects, you might want to participate in. I am always open to cool DMs on Twitter, on Telegram, and I also can refer other women to great female leaders in this space who are hiring. I feel very lucky that I have many close friends who are in uh, leadership roles across crypto and are driving forward uh, incredible innovations across DeFi, NFTs, gaming, et cetera, not just in consumer roles, um, and also, uh, you know, there are roles not just in engineering, there are opportunities in marketing, in biz dev, uh, in operations, research. Uh, and, and the last thing I'll say on this is, once again, the highest performing people I know in crypto are women. These are women in biz dev roles and uh, in marketing roles, everything. So you're joining a great community. Thank you. That's very encouraging. Um, we're running out of time, but before we let you go, uh, uh, we understand that you have uh, experience in various, I mean, tech sector or very, um, uh, I mean, science heavy sector, right? Uh, how do you see the futures of blockchain? Uh, which other sectors do you think that blockchain could have the chemistry with uh, and uh, to drive the max adoptions? Or do you think that it's more about how to, I mean, use and apply blockchain in the real world? What's your view? I think any, any industry or uh, community space 
where information sharing in a uh, guarantee of the integrity of that information is essential, opens an, an opportunity for, for blockchain. Uh, for example, last week there was a headline around one of the major US banks losing or accidentally deleting something like 46 million receipts. Uh, and everyone has pointed to that as evidence of how blockchain can actually be utilized. I think that in you know academia, for example, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of centralized stores of information and research that could be improved by uh, being made open source and immutable in the way that blockchain allows you to do. If you look at history, particularly American history, you'll see that time and time again there were conservative, and I don't mean politically conservative, but more like uh, conservative movements that involved the contraction around uh, freedom of, of speech and thought and research, which led to foreclosure of like different uh, avenues in, in academia and also activism. If these were made permanent and public, it would mean that anyone could have access and participate. Uh, think, think about the early 1900s and research that was around female health, for example. DSI is actually really fascinating to me. And uh, a close friend of mine is involved or, or previously was involved in the MIT press. And their uh, organization was starting to look into and, and is still interested in uh, working with Filecoin, for example, to ensure that all of the conversations happening within ivory tower uh, buildings at MIT actually can be made public and uh, can involve researchers from around the world, but also just like ordinary people. If you care about freedom of speech and if you care about uh, advancements in health and human rights, the uh, conversations and theses around that should be public and accessible always. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your insight. Thank you so much, Rachel. I've had so much fun in this conversation. I think it's incredible that Sin Futures is doing this podcast series and inviting leaders across crypto to come on. These were great questions. And I'm always a fan of what your team is doing. Thank you so much. Andy. Thanks for listening to the Future X podcast. Subscribe on Spotify or wherever you're listening to this episode. 